Welcome to the Unlocking the Club podcast, where we host honest and direct conversations about journeys of access, personal truth, and reclaiming space. We share our truth so that you can find the key to own your truth, honor your journey, and reclaim your space. Grab your keys, your wallet, your phone, and invite your friends to meet you at the club. Here's your host, Angela Taylor. Hello again, I'm Angela Taylor, your host for Unlocking the Club. And today we're actually gonna delve into building your legacy and finding your calling with our special guest, Sheree Buckner Webb. But to get us started, I actually wanna bridge the gap between those two topics um, by talking about wealth building as a follow-up to last week's conversation we had with Amelia Hardy, the Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer with Best Buy. You know, one of the things that uh, Amelia mentioned during that episode was the thing that we really need to do is unlock wealth. And I thought about that after I spoke with her. I think that that is so true in many different ways. Oftentimes I found myself throughout my career prioritizing other things and feeling guilty if I was focusing on and prioritizing wealth building. Uh, And it was simply a mindset that I had that for some reason I felt that I was supposed to do things for the right reason, find jobs that were more about the impact I was going to have, not necessarily the money I was going to be able to generate and put in my bank account. Uh, And I recognized that I needed to shift that mindset. And then when I thought about it a little bit, I remember some of the data that um, we talk about quite often when we're dealing with clients around pay equity. And I remembered that this year in 2022, equal pay day for black women is September 22nd. Let me say that again. Equal pay day for black women is September 22nd. And what that means is equal pay day is the approximate day a black woman must work into the new year to make what a white non-Hispanic man made at the end of the previous year. So basically based on ACHS census data, the 2021 wage gap for black women compared to non-Hispanic white men was 58 cents. And for those who identify as Asian, American, or Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander women, equal pay days is May 3rd, and they're earning 75 cents on the dollar. For those who identify as LGBTQIA+, equal pay day is June 15th, earning 78 cents on the dollar. For mothers, equal pay day is September 8th, earning 58 cents on the dollar. And we all know that women of color are disproportionately affected. And I think that we saw a lot of that over the last two years in COVID when um, the head of households and women that were in the workplace had to make a decision about, um, can I stay in the workplace? Or if I don't have childcare, who's gonna take care of my children? For native women, equal pay day is November 30th. And for Latina women, equal pay day is December 8th, both earning 50 cents on the dollar and 49 cents on the dollar respectively. Now that gap grows exponentially over time. So knowing your worth and negotiating on your own behalf is imperative. And that wasn't something that I frankly knew how to do or was comfortable doing because I didn't want people to think that um, I was being greedy or um, that I was inflating my value. And it took a long time. It was probably 10, 12 years into my career journey where I literally started to negotiate on my own behalf. And that catalyst was after I actually took a job um, that I found myself wanting for years uh, and was so happy that I finally got the opportunity, I didn't want to say no. And I didn't ask all of the right questions. When I asked for information, when I asked for the company's budget, when I asked for their financials, um, I received some information, but I didn't get all of the comprehensive information that I needed to uh, in order to make a good decision. But I wanted that job so badly that I was willing to kind of shuffle that aside and go ahead and say yes. And about a year and a half into that job, I sat on a panel with someone who at the time was the highest ranking female at um, U.S. Bank. And we were having a conversation and uh, they were asking the panel, you know, about what advice you would give to other career women. And uh, this this woman said, there's two things that I would tell anybody. The first is you need to know when to say no, 
um, in the workplace, in particular around the job opportunities that are being proposed to you and you need to make an ask. And she went into more detail and, and said that so often women fall in love with something and they get so far down that road of, of falling in love with the opportunity that when it comes to the value and the quality of that opportunity, it's really difficult for them to say no. And as she was talking about it, it reminded me of some interactions I had with my older brother as we were looking to invest in real estate. And we would go look at some houses and um, I would fall in love with the kitchens or the bathrooms or some of the aesthetics, the, the walk-in closets. And we would leave the house and he would ask me what I thought. And I would say, oh, it's fantastic. Let's definitely invest in this house. And he would say, Angela, did you see the cracks in the in the roof or the ceiling? Did you see the water marks? Like, right, there's some structural things that aren't right with this particular property. Uh, and it reminded me of what happens. Like, right, I was so far down the line, I fell in love with the aesthetics of a job, and I found it difficult to say no to that particular job. Uh, and that was something I had to shift and change and make sure that I was going to have plenty of opportunities, and I had to trust that so that I had the, the sense that I could say no to an opportunity when it wasn't 100% right for me. The second thing that showed up is um, she said, you need to ask for what it is that you want. And again, up until that point in the initial negotiations, maybe I made one ask and talked about my salary range, um, but I didn't ask for everything. I didn't talk about the full compensation package. I didn't give them my bottom line um, that I needed to do. I didn't talk about you know, the different bands at um, work in that particular organization to find out what the range was and where their offer fell in that range. And I recognized I was leaving a lot of money on the table. And then I had a conversation with some of my peers and colleagues who um, were male and they were talking about job opportunities that they had. And they talked about they lost some opportunities when they actually didn't negotiate because there were companies that were saying, if you aren't willing to negotiate on your own behalf, how are you going to advocate on behalf of the organization? And that shifted my mindset a little bit. And so we're not going to go into great detail today. I just wanted to float some things for you to think about. What mindsets do you deploy when you're thinking about your financial well-being? What mindset do you leverage when you are negotiating your next contract or your next salary or compensation package? We should make sure that we're taking in that mindset that if we, in fact, are going to be working twice as hard, that they are going to have to compensate us twice as much for the work that we're doing and that we're no longer going to accept um, that imbalance between how hard we're working, how much we're delivering, and how much we are actually being compensated for that work. And so we'll talk more about wealth building today with our guest, uh, Sheree Buckner-Webb, but we'll continue to have this conversation as we navigate um, the unlocking the club concept, um, because it's an important place that I think that we as Black women need to continue to unlock. And you notice with the data around that equal pay day, it's not just for those of us who identify as Black. Um, it, it also is relevant for many other individuals who identify as women in all other marginalized and historically excluded categories. Uh, and so it's an important thing for us to talk about and to leverage our power and unlock that particular club. So we'll get into a little, little bit more, um, an important piece for us to talk about, but I am really excited today to be in conversation with someone who I look up to, someone who has had a profound impact on my life in a, in a lot of indirect and direct ways, uh, Shree Buckner-Webb. So here's a little bit more about today's guest, Shree Buckner-Webb. On today's episode of Unlocking the Club, I am truly honored to be in conversation with Shree Buckner-Webb. Cherie is a trailblazer and a fifth generation Idahoan. She spent her career breaking down barriers and was the first black woman elected to the Idaho legislature, serving in the state house of representatives from 2010 to 2012, and then serving three terms in the Idaho state Senate, wrapping up her final term in 2020. Cherie is a fierce human rights advocate who has dedicated much of her life to the Boise community. She worked tirelessly to create the Idaho Black History Museum in the historic St. Paul Baptist Church, her great-grandfather's former church. Shri has also served on the boards of a variety of local nonprofits and organizations, including the Women's and Children's Alliance, the Idaho Human Rights Education Center, 
and the Andrew Center for Public Policy, among others. She also owns a local consulting and coaching business that develops diversity training for executives. Outside of her duties as an elected official, Buckner Webb was a certified coach and organizational development consultant and is founder of Sojourner Cons Coaching and Consulting. She is also a senior associate with Yarborough Group based in Denver and white men as school diversity partners based in Portland, Oregon. Her extensive international business background includes positions in operations, e-commerce, leadership development, program management, sales and marketing, global diversity consultation, and individual and group coaching. In addition, she is a highly respected motivational speaker and an accomplished vocalist. Buckner Webb shares her expertise with dozens of organizations through her work on boards and committees. Recently, the Trailblazers legacy was honored by having a park named after her here in Boise, Idaho. Inspiration for the park name came directly from citizen submissions gathered during a public engagement process in 2021 and a group of project stakeholders tasked with sorting through the more than 1200 name ideas identified the submission and the Boise City Council unanimously approved the name Shree Buckner Webb Park. Thanks for tuning in today as we unlock the club with our guest, Sheree Buckner Webb. Sheree, as I said in our opening, it is a true honor and pleasure to have you join us today. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. It's such a joy to be with you today and to be with other women of color when you live in Boise, Idaho. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Very rare occasion. And I have to tell you, and I don't know if I ever shared this story with you, but um, it, it must have been right around the time that you ran for office. But I remember coming home to visit my parents over the holidays. And my father said, I have someone that you have to meet. She's one of the new state representatives in Idaho, the first black woman. And I was like, I, I paused there. I was like, what? There's a black first woman? Black person, first black person. First man or person. woman. Yes. Oh my goodness. That, that is a state representative. And I was like, I have to know her story. I, I want to, like, we've talked a little bit about what you've done over the course of your career, but I am curious, um, who have you had to be over that course of your career to accomplish so much? You know, I was blessed to be raised in a family of, of um, groundbreakers, if you will. And that's on the Johnson side. The Buckners were great. They were, pre they were praying and preaching people and they had their, their, their praying and preaching going on. But on the Johnson side, my mother's side, they believed you needed to own who you were and determine who that was and realize that through your life, that person may change but to be proud of who you were. And they were humble people that came from Arkansas when there was a great lynching that took place back there a long time ago. And they all moved to Idaho, which is interesting, one by one by one. And, and it's to be proud of who you are. I can remember my grandmother who was a modest woman saying, stick out your chest, stand up straight. So who did I have to be? I had to get comfortable with being the one I was at home at church and elsewhere in the state house, in the corporate environment, to be true to who I am, that was that was a that was a hard thing because they didn't know what to do with us. Yeah. Didn't know what to do with us. Well, and and how do you do that? Like literally, because we're hearing all these mixed messages, right? You're trying to fit in, right? Unlocking the club. We talk so often about like here's this space that we think we have to fit into to be accepted into. But how do you show up fully um, as your authentic self? I think one of the important things is I don't know that I necessarily want to be in that club, but I want to be a part of that congregation that makes things happen. And I'm not talking about a church. I want to be a part of that body that has vision and purpose and desire to make things better than they were and to have the opportunity to demonstrate what I can contribute. And I so I didn't worry a lot about the clubs. And even as a teenager, I found suddenly people were inviting me to clubs. There was Job's Daughters. Everybody wanted me to be in Job's Daughters. I went the first day and the lady goes, oh my. And the bottom line was, they didn't have black people in Job's Daughters. And I said, you know what? On second thought, particularly because you have to hesitate. And I was I play about 13, 14. I didn't want to be a part of that club. Mm -hmm. So I helped start white teens and other things that we did. But it, and it and it does. It feels it feels um, exclusionary. But there are some things we're not meant to be. We're not meant to be a part of. We are meant to set our own course. Well, I think that's such an important piece, right? We are meant to set our own course. Yes. And yet and still society tells us otherwise. Yeah, they do. And we don't have to be exclusionary just because they are. Because yeah. we want to pick the bright and the best no matter where. And we want to go together, together, not one on top of the other, not one better than another, but together we can change the world. And I believe that. Yes. You know, I recently was at an event where um, Heather McGee, um, an expert economic 
policy analyst um, who recently wrote the book, The Some of Us, talked about that. Like collective action is yes. what is required. And it feels like some of us get that and it's a priority for some of us and for others, it's not quite the case. Like, how do you navigate both of those spaces, particularly uh, in the in the courthouse, in the state house, like where you are having to build consensus? Well, there's a lot of, you think about where you've been all over your life and a lot of times you've done it. Um, I was a Democrat, which is the minority. I was black. I was a woman of a certain age already. And, and people say, well, I don't think of you as black. And I go, shame on you. I tell you I'm black. I tell you I want to be referred to as black. I tell you I'm proud to be a black. And you insult me by saying you don't think of me as black. And I and sometimes I hear the, 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 the roar and cry of my foremothers in my ears saying, be proud of who you are. And I think that's my guiding talisman. I think of all my great aunts and grandmothers and the stories of all of them. And I have a charge to keep. There's a song in the church that you say, a charge to keep have I. And not only to glorify God, but to glorify them who made me who I am today. And I get wrapped up. I get fired up when I think about those that didn't have the opportunity that I have. And I want to leave a legacy, just as every one of us do, for those that come after us. So I have a responsibility. It doesn't seem like a choice. It just Sometimes I get attitude, actually. It'll make me just stand up and show up and show out every once in a while. Well, you said you want, to leave, you want to leave a legacy and, you know, it resonates with me for so many different reasons. And I wonder, was that the case? Like all your ancestors, you can tell, right, the soul that shows up for you um, that emanates from your ancestors. Yes. Leaving a legacy, was that something that you talked about with your family, the Johnsons, the Buckners? Like, where did that come come alive inside of you. And that wasn't even just people that were related to me. If you listen to the stories of our ancestors, I'm talking about black people. Yeah. We heard about a brighter tomorrow every day and in every, every book you've read that has historical presence, whether it was uh, making a new area uh, in the country, whether it was religion, whether it was home, whether it was wealth, whether it was having children that got to come to life and that were allowed to live and to work and I mean, all those things, they didn't say the word legacy, but they talked about their charge to keep. And I just, I was, a, a, I loved history when I was a child and the history of my folks was for, first and foremost for me. And I think about that and, and I mean, I can feel it. It's tangible to me. And I see it in the young women that I see today, stepping up and stepping out and taking risks and sometimes being the only and trying to speak their truth and doing it. I just see that in young women, much younger women than I. And then I see that in my ancestors. I, I just see it and I just have to celebrate it. I have to call it out. I may see somebody on your show that I've never met and pick up a phone afterward and call her to say how delighted I am to see her. I think we have to lift each other up while we're lifting ourselves up. Right, well, and, and that is one thing that uh, is part of your legacy. I hear so often where, someone picked up the phone, somebody who was planning to attend Boise State University, right? And they, they don't know anyone in the Black community here in Boise, and they somehow, some way find their way to you. They reach out and you not just carve out time to, to respond to them, but you carve out time to be part of their life and their journey and their transition to Boise. Where did you get that energy? You have a lot going on, as we can tell. How do you find that energy? I think when you have a love of things, you get time. One of the things I have to learn now that I'm 70, God, I can't believe I'm even saying those seven. words. I used to lie about it all the time, but now it's going to give me a break. Um, the things that matter, you make them happen. Maybe you do them differently, but we have work to do. We are responsible. Think of the people in our lives um, that made a way for us, indirectly or directly. Yeah. I mean, I think of <laughs> your amazing career. I remember when I first heard of the, the walking... Uh, restaurant stuff here. You know, I called you up. You know, I had to call. I go, girl, what are you doing? How come I didn't know? Who can I tell? Because we have so many people in the corporate environment that come here to go, I don't know what to do. Well, I can tell you what to do. I can tell you who to call. That's that's a blessing to me and to you. Yeah. And that's and to the, all that you touch. So that's just, we we make time for what we must do. Yeah. Well, and, and I have to send you your flowers because not everyone makes time. Um, but from that call that you made uh, about five years ago when I was oh. watching Indoors Boise to now. So you were finding out what it was we were doing and how you can help. 
And now we are actually starting one of our tours in the Sheree Buckner Web Park. Get out, get out, get out. Get out. Talk yeah. about like how things yeah. change over time. Uh, but, you know, I do want to kind of delve into a little bit um, with you, Sheree, of like, how do you actually determine that I want to show up and run for office in this predominantly white city um, that right has been really difficult for people of cover, color to navigate in leadership positions. Like what was the thought that popped into your mind and what did you have to do to start to canvas? My community? mother was really active in human rights early, early on. We had our first uh, human rights event on the steps of the Capitol shortly after Martin Luther King died and I was there. And in our front yard, when we bought our house in the North End, when I was six years old, somebody burnt up. Uh, uh, cross in our front yard. And my mother, my dad would like to make nice and put it away and not let anybody see. And my mother said, the SOBs are late. We've been here for months. You know, we're not moving. Put that on the front porch and let him see that. Dorothy was crazy woman. She was a baby of eight children. And she, I don't know. I don't know where all her strength came from. So I come from that kind of a legacy. But one of the things that I've learned to do, and, and you kind of talked about it that in your, in your opening comments, is figuring out who you are. Where you say, I kept, I, I realized that it would be a competitive advantage for me to knock on doors. Now there could be people that didn't want me there, but they could. Re there's you know eighty thousand white people running for jobs, and one black woman who are they gonna remember that comes to their door. That's true. I mean, so I got an opportunity and people were always asking, why are you running? And it wasn't always nice, but I can tell you why I'm running. I'm a fifth generation. I believe in this community. I believe we can do better. I, I mean, and it was the opportunity. Sometimes if the door got shut, they still remembered they shut the door. They remembered. It was opportunities for us and for our community as a whole, black, white, no matter what, men and women, people of color, LGBT, for all of us to do better. So it was that, I thought it was my competitive advantage to knock on the door and lo and behold, and that was kind of interesting because I'm a Democrat and we were few in number, but a whole lot of folks voted for me that knew my dad, knew my mom, knew my brothers. My brother was a jock. My dad was a jock. He went to Boise State University. There are all kinds of connections. I was on all kinds of boards. So was my mother. Some of those things, your involvement and what you believe in came to be of, of value for me. Mm. So competitive advantage. When we talk about mindset, having that mindset of understanding like yes. Like, right, this is why I'm special. This is why I'm unique. And let me actually leverage that. And I'm not sure if you had this experience, but for the, the early part of my career, like it was overwhelming being the only one in the room, like, right? And sometimes you wanted to shy away from that, like, right? You wanted to suppress who you were so that you weren't othered in those, those meetings and those conversations. And then you realize that it is your competitive advantage. Did you ever have that experience? And how do you close the gap from going like you, you don't want to draw attention to yourself? even when you are in the room, to it being your competitive advantage? Well, I think one of the realities is there's no way you can not draw attention to yourself just by who you are and who your personhood. And I, I was working in a, for Boise Cascade and I was working in aviation and I was doing real typical female things. And I didn't ask those questions about salary and stuff like that. And then I said, I don't wanna do this stuff all the time, strictly female work. And um, so I said, I'm going to work in a sawmill. It was really ignorant. I didn't do my homework about that. And the first day that I got this job as a purchasing manager for, for four sawmills and two in Mexico, I went up to northern Idaho and they were telling me, now, this is a log. No kidding, really. And this is how we cut the log. I mean, they were really being so unbelievably pedestrian. How should I put it? And we got to one part and they said, here, you cut this. Now, come on in here and you stand behind the sawyer, the man that cuts the log, you know, with computers and stuff like that. And then the guy's ears turned very, very red in front of me. And the manager that was taking me through and he goes, well, then the, then, then I said, so what do you call that machine? Uh, we need to go in my office and I'm going to use the vernacular. Okay. So he went in the office and he says, Sheree, we call that next piece of equipment, the nigger. And I said, oh, I hesitated. I left a pregnant pause because my heart was beating pretty good right then and tried to find the words. And the words I said was, I suppose since I'm managing these facilities, we'll be calling it the log turner in the future. Nice. And if you'd like to get support, if you'd like to get support for your mill, you'll tell you guys, let's call that the log turner. So, I mean, it's, it made me grow too. Because, I mean, I could have gone into tears or got irritated or let me tell you what that means. No. As we gain position and power, we get to choose how we respond. And uh, so to be different was good. I mean, I've heard 20 years after I've worked there that people said, we used all kinds of language that was really demeaning to everybody. 
and even the things they called women. Some of them were wives and others of, of folks that work there. So we have an opportunity. And I just think if, if somebody's going to put that trouble in my way, I'm going to try to do good work. Right. Well, and that's one of the things we have to unlock. We have to unlock vernacular because so often there's language, whether it's in real estate and, you know, yes, bedroom or owners, like to the, the name of that, that machine. And I have to say, you know, Cherie, you did something uh, about a month ago in an email exchange for a really important project, um, the Irma Heyman house that I know is near and dear to your heart, mm -hmm. where um, you so gracefully provided that context and feedback to someone about how to address uh, you know, women of esteem in the black community. And I thought it was, it was a TED talk, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was so great to observe how, again, gracefully and authentically, but powerfully you showed up in that email exchange unequivocally and how the person responded to you was, was thankful for, for you pointing yeah. that out. Because they don't call our they don't call our women Mrs. or Doctor or whatever that title is. It's, they were calling her Irma Heyman. She died at 100 years old and made an impact in our, our community. And I said, in our community, we don't refer to women as by their first name. And we don't. You miss so-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so. That's what we do. And we deserve it. Yeah. And we just need to honor that. Demanding that respect. And I think one of the things that your mother always said to you was disturb the peace. Yes. That was her credo. Yeah. Disturb the peace. And I think that's <laughs> make good trouble, whatever you want to call it. But it was disturb the peace. And that I've tried to live up to her um, um, teachings, her teachings, disturb the peace. Yeah. We have a, we have a unique lens and if we don't communicate some of the things that we see, feel, and experience, folks will keep on doing what they've been doing for a hundred years, yeah, a thousand years. Well, when I heard you refer to that um, kind of uh, from your from your mother, disturb the peace. It reminded me of a book um, that um, we cite quite often by Dr. Resma Minikin called "My Grandmother's Hands." Yes, uh, and it talks about racialized trauma. And the concept behind "My Grandmother's Hands" was that like. Right. His grandmother was someone who worked in the cotton fields. And if you're picking cotton, like, right, there those thorns like can just shred your hands. And he saw his grandmother's hands just shredded. But at the same time, they would heal themselves so that they would fortify themselves for the next time um, she was picking cotton. And so use that as a um, analogy, if you will, yes. for yes. The resiliency and trauma that we as black women have to navigate. Right. In the same moments that we're experiencing trauma. When you got me, us. you got me in those same hands. So damaged birth babies yeah. and fed children and dealt with all kinds of other inhumane kinds of activities. But they persevered. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah. right. Well, and that's what showed up for me when I heard about the cross burning. Right, that your mother didn't say we're going to throw this away. We're going to put that on display to let people know. Like it had to be a traumatic experience for you. You were, you know, six, eight years old. I was old. so little. I didn't understand it till I was much older. But my mom understood it. Yeah. And all the relatives came that were living in River Street and came to the house and stood around and said, "We're going to move you guys back." And my mom said, "Absolutely not." Well, and that balance again in that moment, there's probably trauma for your mother and resilience. How does that show up for you? Both the trauma of encountering something for the first time and the resilience that you have to show up with to leave a legacy? Well, I think sometimes it's not been as hard for me. If, But if I see something happening to a child hmm. or a younger woman or a younger man, all that emotional stuff comes up. Good thing I didn't show that stuff much when I was young. That's what That's what'll get me now. That's what will get me when I think about, I have one and only one granddaughter. But I can, I got more kids that I've picked to be mine, that kind of thing. But I don't want that to happen. I don't want, I don't mind that they have trials and, and, and then they will also have triumphs. But I can't stand that it continues to happen, yeah. continues to happen to them. It shows up and uh, have to hark back to the things that I've heard that so many of our families have experienced and so many successes that we've experienced. But those sex successes came through hard times. I, I have a real, a knack for um, a real estate like you do. But that came from that same Grandpa Johnson. We'd go for rides on Sunday. That was our big time. And he'd see a, I'm serious, an outhouse. And he'd say, Sherry, 
that you need to buy that outhouse. And I was young and I go, why would I buy an outhouse? Do you know what happens in there, grandpa? Of course I do. But can you see the value in that outhouse in that field? Mm-hmm. And I can remember from, from a little girl, then I used to go with him to collect rent down in the River Street area, that kind of thing. So I can look at a, a not so fancy house and see things that we can do to it. So that's been a, yeah. yeah. I want to go back to, to something that you said a moment ago about um, when you were younger, not being willing or able to show that weakness yeah. or that fear. Tell me a little bit more about that sense of, of having to suppress what was truly going on. And, you know, I was young. I don't know if I realized it was suppression or as I'm not going to let them make me sweat. Yes. That's the big thing. And I knew once I hit 19th Street or I was at Aunt Ellen's or at, at Grandma's or Nanny's that I would be enveloped in love and supported and allowed to cry a bit and then to get mad as hell and go back tomorrow and do it again. Yeah, but I, I did feel that I didn't want folks to know. I mean, like that joining different organizations and then they have a closed membership or something like that. Or or um, I went with my folks when we knocked on doors when there was uh, segregated housing and redlining and we would show up and do all that. I mean, and that was even after we already had our own house. But that was one of the processes. And we were to look our best and we were to be the most excuse me, well-mannered and well-spoken. I mean, so I'd been kind of taught to do that from a child. And you think about when we take our kids places and when we see what our kids do and what other kids do, we've taught our kids how to dress, how to talk. Even if you're really, really mad, don't, don't knock that little boy out. Come tell me about it or some kinds of things. We've learned that duality of our walk. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we don't feel it or that we're not dealing with it, but we've learned to step up yeah. instead of to step down to their level. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I shared on the show kind of the story of, of, of George Floyd's murder. Um, and that was on the heels of right, the the woman in Central Park calling the cops on the bird watcher. And where I recognize in the the short aftermath how often I had, right? Don't let them see you sweat. That next day you gotta show up fully. You don't want to let them know that you were affected. And that I can no longer do that in service of others. I had to do it in service of myself. Yes. Like, have you ever had that internal dialogue about, you know, never letting them see you sweat when it serves you well and when it doesn't serve you well and what to do in those moments? Often, often. And one of the most recent ones was was during the legislature. And there's, there's a gentleman that was uh, in our body who has great stature within a certain very prolific church here. And I was, and it was when I was talking about some things about just a license plate. It was a license plate. So I, I thought this one was going to sail through, you know, Idaho's too great for, hey, hey, we, we've known that for a long time. And he calls me on the phone. He says, I'm going to vote against this because, and again, I don't think of you as a black. And I said, you need to, because you're really pissing me off. That's what I said. And you're not supposed to do that when you're on the floor. But, but I mean, yes, there are things that even in petty times, but also in really important times that it's, it's, it almost feels like it cuts you in half. But in the wholeness of who I am, I know I can integrate that. I can be whole and I can speak the truth. And sometimes I need to be still and listen. That's my greatest challenge. Mm. To be still and listen and really learn about who that person is who continually comes up and puts their arms around me and tell me how much they enjoy me, how much they appreciated me. They know this one, that one or whatever in my in my circumstances. I need to listen. I need to listen and hear who they really are and then take action at another time or not, or not. Or not. Well, I think that's important too. And listening, I think is an important part of this unlocking concept. Ooh. One of the reasons- What are they really saying? Yes. Exactly, right. And, and one of the reasons I started this podcast was because you know the last seven years, and, and you know it well, I was able to spend some amazing quality time with my mother. Yes. And it was in those moments that she shared some of the stories, like right, of her journey, and uh, I knew it was wasn't easy before, but she gave me more of the specifics, and wow. I got curious about like, gosh, like I would have loved to have known that earlier, but yes. it also was something that she didn't want to put that burden on me. Yes, at the age where I had this idealistic kind of viewpoint of what the world was. Like, what's that balance? I think you've talked about that a little bit too in in your family of like things you didn't know about your grandfather until later. Lots of things I didn't know. I don't, things I didn't know about my dad. I mean, were good things, some of them. I was surprised and, and, and how their lives actually ended, all kinds of things that happened. But I think 
past generations tried to make a way for us. And some of the ways they thought about making a way was protecting us because they had not been protected. Yeah. Generations of our people did not have protection, although their parents and people who loved them did the best they could, but at their own peril also. So I, I, um, I know that when my Aunt Ellen uh, heard that I heard about uh, one, one uh, the Johnson side, a lot of them coming on the railroad and somebody's brother was a, a Pullman porter and they'd have kids try to look little so they could get in for free and all that. She said, we didn't want you to think that that was all right to do that. So it wasn't, it was the right thing. Maybe it was wrong for the railroad, but it was okay for us. I mean, they, they taught us lessons about right and wrong. And they also taught about what the times were like and what times required. I'm, or that, or that my grandfather Johnson and two of the boys came hitchhiked. What do they call it? Hoboed out on the railroad to get here to meet everybody else. And they got arrested in Salt Lake and they got put on the, put in jail. My grandfather was a deacon even back where he was then. And he, uh, and uh, they said, I, when I heard this story, I was 35 years old and they said, and, and uh, uh, Luther Johnson started praying, oh, Father God, we thank you for the grace of these folks who have brought us in out of that cold. And they said he prayed up a storm, prayed and prayed. And he had two sons with him, too, and one other guy. And and the, the jailer was so touched. He said, all right, Mr. Johnson, I'm going to let you and your boys out. They knew they were moving to Idaho. But don't you ever get on a train. And he said, bless your father. Father God, bless him. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. And they said they went down two blocks and they went right to the railroad yard, got on the railroad and came on on the Idaho. To live. So they hoboed anyway. Hmm. So those are some of those things, you know, you're taught, don't do this, don't do that. But it was a way. Yeah, it was a way. They weren't encouraging me to do wrong, but they were encouraging me to look for your family and do what you need to do. Right. Well, you, you mentioned what the time requires. Um, and I'm curious for you to share with our listeners out there, some of which may be interested in a, a career in politics. Um, and we're starting to see those numbers go up. So when you first ran for office, right, a decade or so ago, um, we didn't have the same fervor um, for women to run Very for office that we're seeing now. And it's, and it's out of necessity. Um, but what does the time require now to be a woman or a Black person uh, in politics? I think that in years past, men have made this, uh, made this uh, myth that you had to be a certain person in business or whatever or whatever. And none of that's true. Mm -hmm. We are citizen legislators. We're made, we're made up of a composite of people that live in our communities. So if you can read and write and you have the desire and the fervor, you are the right person for the job. If you are dedicated enough to do it for no money to speak of, you know what I'm saying? I don't care what part of the legislature you're in and a willingness and a willingness and a commitment. That's what it takes. Don't let somebody tell you, you can't do it. Listen, uh, oh, it's so hard to raise. It's not that hard to raise money. The thing that's hard is to ask for money. Mm, yes. But who better to ask for money than me that says, I'm going to do this for you when I get there for us. Mm -hmm. If you're committed by God, you need to, you, you should ask. And so we should. So anybody that decides to run and wants the ABCs to holler at me, I'll be glad to do it because no one is more worthy. No one is more representative. No man has the same perspective that you have, whether you're high in a, a corporation or you're a beginner or you've been a mother or a babysitter or a teacher, whatever it is, we need all that. We need to be reflective of the communities we represent. What do you think it was about you and your journey and your perspective that allowed you to garner so much respect um, in both the House and the Senate? I don't know, everyone's mouth, I don't know what it was. I don't know how much respect it was. I think I think that I have a real reputation as being a truth teller. Mm. And I think that's it. And I have to be more tactful sometimes with the truth. <laughs> but telling the truth, I mean, folks, I mean, really, truly, you know, we've lived our lives the way we've lived, particularly as, as black women. And we think that some things are so apparent with regard to our lives. And there are a lot of people that don't, well, was it any different for you? Well, didn't you do that? Well, I didn't know. Your brother couldn't get into this or that? Oh, why didn't you get hired for this? They really walk around not knowing what they don't know. Yeah. I don't think it's my job to educate them at every, at every turn, but the perspective we bring is needed and valued because we represent this country that we live in powerfully. We have done it since the beginning, even when they were completely diminishing us. We're here. We're not leaving. We've got much to offer. 
And what's the balance between like sharing and answering their questions or proactively offering them with a perspective and, and encouraging them to do their own work? Well, sometimes I, I, one of my favorite things is, I'm sorry, I'm not your mama. Mm. I hate to be so, so trite, but you know, it's important. You're interested. You're truly interested. Do some investigating. Then come talk to me. Do your homework, then let's talk. And know that my perspective is not the perspective of every single black woman, 70 years old, that was raised in the country. Yes. It's not the same. We are a, a, a plethora of responses, of insights, of all kinds of things. And I can't, I get really distressed when people say, well, don't all black, don't, they don't say all, but they, that's the inference. Don't black people do so-and-so? Some do, some don't. Yeah, we're not a monolith. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, was there a, a burden being the first, right? I think sometimes like when you were the first to kick down the door, to be the first in, at the at the, the table, the first in this this position, there's a there's a pressure that you put on yourself. And sometimes it's an internal pressure and an external pressure. Was there that sense for you being the first black person in the legislature? Well, again, I think part of the issue was for me, that was good for me. My parents raised me to, your, people are watching you. Mm. You know, I think all of us have gotten that. People are watching you, particularly in, in businesses that there are not many of us. And there was pressure to do the very best I could do. I, nobody could put more pressure on me than I do myself. But it wasn't necessarily the pressure that they put on me. But I was conscious of being under the microscope. I got more, I think I got more camera time than anybody did. Oh, look, she can conjugate a verb. Have mercy. You know what I mean? I mean, I just, I mean, the reality of it is, and people would say, oh, you're so well-spoken and you expected what? Yeah. You know, I don't say it all the time, but I'm, I've got this dialogue going in my head. And I think we don't have the luxury of wasting a lot of time on what's the pressure. And if we have the pressure, let's go to another sister or another brother and have that conversation. Um, because oftentimes we're perceived as whining about it there's a right time to go to a, 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 an HR manager or, or somebody that you have an alignment with and say, this is not equitable and this is untenable and you need to be make something happen. That's true. But we also have to learn, we've got to figure out how to uh, walk that walk and talk the talk because they don't know what they don't know what sometimes. They don't want to know what they don't know. And you know, another thing that I found out that was really amazing and I was in corporate life for a long time for, with HP for, oh God, uh, 10 years with Boise Cascade for 10 years. 10 years is my thing uh, for federal government for 10 years. Yeah, all those were 10 years before I started my own companies. And um, it's really interesting when you're in a, uh, and I traveled around the world with those companies and I'm lucky to do that. They're a little bit fearful too. Mm. They're a little bit fearful. And sometimes I would, you know, I go home and call my mom, go, you're not going to believe it. I think he's worried. You know, shame on me. But you hear what I'm saying? Um, I don't rush to judgment every time, but I do question. And I may have to take it up. Even with the, the little note that I wrote about the Irma Heyman house, I read the deal and it took me two days to decide, you know, I, it was something that just kept bugging my spirit. Yeah. And then I just, you know, thought I'd just let you know. And I did intentionally write it to everybody that she wrote it to yeah. so that they could too be illuminated. Yeah. Well, and, and you talk about fear. I think fear shows up in a lot of different ways and it gets us to stop, right? It's to stop actually even being in activity in a way that we can have a positive impact. Where do you see our peers in other identities, in dominant culture identities, showing up in fear? And how do we unlock the fear for them in a way that could, could serve our purposes? You know, one of the things that really makes me irritable, and, and this is not what you said, Angela, but it makes me irritable. They think we're supposed to come fix stuff for them. That's not my job. They need to get off their sorry behinds and do their work. And I say that it's important that you do your work. I'm not going to do your work for you. Yes. And I believe they are walking in fear sometimes. I believe it. And you're a grown, I'm not trying to be vernacular, you're an adult, yeah. you're paid as a professional, now come do the work. Don't just hire somebody to do DE and I and think, okay, we're good. And you're still treating the people, people the way you were treating them before. That's an error in judgment. And I will call you on it. Yes. But I say, just as we are responsible to do our work, they, particularly when you talk about salaries and positions, and sometimes we don't even know the rules of the game to look to see what we should be asking for, okay. then get off your behind and do your work. Yes. What does I mean? look good. 
Yes. I can. Yeah. Or? Or not, right? <laughs> well, and I, as I listen to you, it reminds me, you know, I have a sports background. It reminds yes. me of some of the elite athletes and, and your family showed up this way as well, um, who they want to be coached. They want people to challenge them. And I think so often in this work that we're doing around equity inclusion in particular, um, we get that feedback all the time is that, you know, like that white men um, enjoy being in conversation with Stacy and I, uh, my business partner with the Dignitas Agency. And it's not because we're taking it easy on them. We're doing the work for them, but we're holding them accountable. We're challenging them, but we're doing it because there's a there's a goal. Like we're not trying to make them feel bad. We're actually trying to get them to, to leverage their influence and their power. And they have hired you and they say they want that. So you ask for it, you got it. Yeah, yeah. Like how do you balance that? Like, and, and figure, you've talked a lot about relationships and I think relationships matter in this. Uh, in order for us to be able to close those gaps. But how have you navigated building relationship? Well, I really love that you changed, instead of balancing so much, you talked about navigating, and that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. We navigate, you get with a certain person that you have an amazing rapport with today and tomorrow, it could be crap. And it could be for external reasons that have nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that we walk in the door with is a sensitivity to what we're hearing and what we're seeing. I don't mean to be overly zealous about, oh, they made my feelings hurt, I don't care about. That's not what I'm talking about, or they hurt my feelings or they misunderstood. But it is a navigation and you have to make good decisions about when to and when not to. And just because you don't um, tackle a situation that made you uncomfortable today doesn't mean that it's never gonna be tackled. Hmm. But for you to remove yourself, and think it through fully. What did I say? What did they say? What was the precursor to that, that it helps us? So that navigation, I, I love that word because sometimes you have to slow down. Sometimes you have to turn to the right. Sometimes you have to turn to the left. And uh, I remember when I first, when, you know, I've known your, your parents for a long, long time. Uh, and I was hearing about you going in into professional athletics. I believe you're the first woman that I ever met went into professional athletics and I thought, have mercy, wow. have mercy. So if anybody knows navigation, because you're smart, you're capable, you're athletic, you're all these things, you had to decide which world you were going to go when and where. I mean, even, I mean, I've had 50 different careers, not 50, but many. Yeah. And each one of them has been a choice. And uh, I think that's what we do. We make good choices. We test ourselves. And it doesn't mean that we're, we've uh, outgrown something, but maybe we have. Maybe it's time for something new. You have so many things to offer to the world and so many things to enrich your life with. And you've done that. I mean, just, just, just since you came back to Idaho, have mercy. I mean, I really have to say that's phenomenal. Thank that's you. phenomenal. Thank you. And again, I have right this amazing group of people such as yourself and my mother to look up to. Right. And I think that that is what's so beautiful about black women is yes. have to our right and our left and before us. Um, and, and to your point, like throughout history, I, I went to the um, African-American History Museum, um, Smithsonian in D.C. In, in April. And the number of stories about strong black women doing amazing things back then, I can't even imagine the challenges that they had to overcome to be able no to choice, no, no choice, no choice. Have you ever felt like you had no choice? Sure, sure, I have. Uh, when I when I first got divorced from my kid's father, hallelujah. I mean, I don't mean that nasty, but it was it was a good thing to do. It was a good thing, yeah. good thing to do. He still thinks I'm adorable, but anyway, let's get to the point. Um, when you talk about being tired and and what are you going to do? Two babies. I mean, I had parents. So my parents were ba weren't babysitters. They were good. They were close. They were that kind of thing, but. And that's, that's how I started singing for a living. I, I'd, I'd sung in school and all that kind of stuff. But that was a cool gig that I could do on the side, work, work the other one full time, take care of the babies, wash the dishes, do all the stuff that we do. Because you're a W-O-M-A-N. That's what we do. Yeah. A lot of women that have started businesses in their home, that's been the catalyst. Because we do what we do and we be what we be. I've heard, I'm sure you've heard that before. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's fine. And let me vouch for, for you all. Uh, Sheree has a beautiful voice. Uh, again, was was honored um, that you sang at my mother's uh, celebration of life ceremony last November, um, saying um, His Eyes on the Sparrow. Uh, and it was a beautiful acapella rendition. Um, Mother was a classy, classy woman. 
Well, again, the community, and that's one of the things that I've noticed in Boise, and we hear quite a bit from whether it's our guests or listeners who are navigating, right, um, predominantly white spaces, right, whether it's in um, undergrad or grad school, whether it's in the communities that they grow up in, whether it's in the boardrooms, and being able to navigate those spaces with grace is so important and to be able to see and have people that are doing it well is really important. Who were some of those? I know like in your family, you had some of those icons to follow. Who were some of the other? You know, I, I have had so many wonderful times. I got to spend time with um, Maya Angelou when she was here. When I got to spend, I mean, I had the whole day. Oh gosh, now I've just spaced her name. We don't love her. The woman that got on the bus. Yeah, what's, Rosa. What I yeah, Rosa. Rosa, Rosa and I spent a whole day and half a night together when she was here. I mean, and then there are women unknown to you and unknown to others that, that have just been in my life. And and she, Rosa Parks reminded me so much of my grandmother, my mom's mom. She talked like her. She wore hair like her. She just was so pragmatic and practical. And I'd read all the books before I met her. And I just thought, wow. And she said, I am your grandmother. Mm, wow. I am. Interesting. That's so powerful. There's so many women. Mm -hmm. And I think when I sum it up, I think uh, the words that I use when I get shaky are power, passion, and purpose, because I like alliteration. Mm. Power, passion. Or we have power and we have passion because sometimes ha passion is what gets us gen bad mm -hmm. and remember our purpose. That's kind of over my forehead all the time. Power, passion, and purpose. We are blessed to be women of power, passion, and purpose. Yeah. Well, what is the way that you're going to use your power and passion for your next purpose? Well, you know, I, I have a, a consulting firm and what I'm doing most of all is um, organizational development design and leadership training. And I love it mm -hmm. because uh, so many, particularly women of color, are leaders in so many ways, but don't recognize it. Yes. And if I can help you see your leadership, if I can help you own your leadership, that that's that's pretty powerful um there's so many challenges and opportunities and if you speak your truth to power mm, mm, mm. and we have to decide how to speak that truth we have nuance we have all kinds of things that we can bring to the party i i love my sisters i can't tell you uh people will tell you that they're in boise and a black couple walks, walks down the street. I stop and go, hi, I'm Sharique, because there's so few of us. I go, are you here visiting? What do you do? I do it all the time. And we made such wonderful friends, got, brought new kids to Boise State, all kinds of things. But I'm, I love my people. There's nothing like us. Yeah. I just lift us up all the time. Yeah, which is beautiful. And it's one of the things that, you know, I just um, heard about this a couple of years ago, Sheree, when um, the city of Boise did the Fettuccine Forum. Uh, with Dr. Jill Gill, I believe is, is yeah. um, her name from Boise State that talked about civil rights um, history in Idaho. And I knew growing up, I always wondered why there weren't more people who looked like us mm -hmm. right, in Mountain Home or in Boise or on the, the playing fields. And then I heard her presentation uh, and all the things, the laws right, that are on the books that everyone assumes are just in the South or, or oh, they're yeah, over yeah. there, but they, they were present here. And you mentioned redlining. One of the things that just recently happened, there were some students at the College of Idaho that worked on a bill um, to get some of the language out of uh, contracts. Still on the books. Still on the books in 2022. Yeah. Our house, the house which we bought on 19th, my mom and dad's house, um, it just got the first approval to be on the uh, I, the United States Historical Register because of lots of civil rights planning that went on in their house for all that time. But black, white people, people from all walks of life, our house was full all the time. It was really interesting. That was another, another thing that lifts us up. And the other thing that you may not know that Idaho, at the time when both my grandparents' families came here, blacks could buy and own property. We could get homesteading money. So that's why Miss Miss Irma and mm -hmm. and the Buckners and and others bought property in Nampa and Caldwell. So although there's redlining here, they could own property. So they they did farms here. That's surprising. We need to know our own history. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that till I was an adult. Yes, and that's the last thing I'd like to to leave this section with is unlocking the club by 
talking about our history. Like you can just tell, you ooze with your family history and the history of your family's journey from Arkansas to Idaho. And it's so important. And I think so often, because we don't have access to it in, in, in the classrooms, um, both black and white people don't have access right. to an understanding of the history. How do we change that? We have to make it. We have to make it a um, a priority. That's the first thing. I, I ask fifty questions. I, I mean, I've looked up. I don't know how many people on on diet, whatever it's called, the DNA thing and all that stuff. I don't like to do it, but I have a girlfriend that'll do it for me. <laughs> and and to ask the questions because some of the things that my grandfather just blew me away. I didn't know that he went to, to that his family all all eight of them moved to Homedale first. Why would you move to Homedale? And then when the last three were living, my grandfather's hundredth birthday, we took him and his two brothers and two, no, there was two sisters, two, two brothers. Anyway, we got in a car, got in a, a bus and drove over there. And this is so funny. Now these people are really old. And I'm saying, um, um, do you know what part of town you lived in? And my, and the youngest brother was like 85. And he said, I think it was near running water. And my grandfather's hundred years old, turns around from the front seat. Of course there was running water. We didn't have water that you turned on the thing. There was had to be running water. I mean, it's really funny to hear them talk about, and they want to share those things, but they didn't when they could have, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe we didn't ask, maybe we weren't interested. Right. But it's, it's, and it doesn't have to be my family. It doesn't have to be your family. We can ask families of friends and others to share their stories so that we can be enriched by their stories and encouraged. Yes, unlocking the stories. I think that is the perfect way for us to start to open up opportunities, right? is to be able to share stories. And I appreciate you carving out time to share your story, your powerful journey uh, with um, our listeners, with Unlocking the Club. And I want to take a quick break. Uh, and then coming back out of the break, we'll do the back nine with some not so rapid fire questions, uh, getting to know um, Sheree a little bit more. Um, we'll you. be right back on Unlocking the Club with Sheree Buckner Webb. All right, we are back on Unlocking the Club with the back nine with Shree Buckner Webb. Um, again, so grateful for the context and the contour that you've brought to this conversation that we've had today. Uh, and I get curious for you, Shree, what's a space that you feel, whether it's here in Idaho, um, in Boise specifically, or in the US that needs to be unlocked? Wow. You know, we have so many secrets in our country. We have so many things that need to be unlocked. I think the more we know about each other, the more we get uncomfortable, if the more we are discomforted, I believe we'll unlock all kinds of magic and 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 opportunity. I think that's so important. Like right, we we seek to be comfortable, like right, and we don't grow and learn in that space. And so it's so important that we put ourselves in those uncomfortable spaces so we can learn about ourselves and others. We can even share our stories because we used to keep everything close to us. We don't want them to know that we suffered. Yeah, we suffered. It was rough. Yeah. I don't want you to know it. So. Yeah. Well, how do we unlock that? Because I think that that is generational. And that was what I discovered with my mom. I think that like it was a conscious effort not to share those stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, protecting, and yeah. protecting yourself. Yeah. Like how do we I think of your father in the military and I go, oh, my gosh, that was no easy task. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. How do we find the balance? If, if you're speaking to you know, a young woman, woman in corporate space, um, how does she determine when to share her story and when not to? Well, this is what I say. One of, my, one of my other buzzwords is risk. I just say you have to risk. And I say that to white women. I say it to white people, risk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the things that comes with somebody taking a risk that I, on the receiving end of the risk they're taking, have to be sure that I hold myself back and don't rest, rush to judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, um, maybe I have a story about, um, and I've heard this story many times, we were taught, not this isn't my own story, but we were never taught to trust white people. Mm. Now, how do you think a white person receives that? Um, on the other hand, we knew that black people couldn't do the work that we do. We knew that you guys just weren't smart enough. Those are two of the kind of things that you might hear. Yeah. And the choice is how do you respond to that stuff? Yeah. Well, how and to it? how do you respond to that? And the currency particularly in the corporate space is trust, like, right? After you are able to you know, impress everyone with your, your talent and your ability and drive value, if you wanna to continue to grow and get opportunities at the top of the, the organization, you have to build trust with the decision makers. And so if you don't trust, it's gonna to be tough for them to trust you. And, and I tell, and, I, and this sounds contradictory, but I also say 
to be considered, considerate about who you trust or in what arena you trust them. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. that. That's okay. That's a doozy right there. In what arena you trust? You know, somebody can be very great about telling you where the dish, where the, where the bathroom is and how we do. And we have these meetings and we have these lunches, but are you going to tell me how to unlock the door of exactly what it takes to get that job? Or what is the holdup that I, I mean, I may be talking to you and I know that I'm more uh, prepared for that next job, but you're going to get the first shot at it. How do I find that? So know that truth has gradations. Mm. Truth, and even why I say we have to speak the truth, they have to speak the truth, but be considerate about what truth you speak and to whom. Yes, yes. Because at the end of the day, like it's about power, unfortunately, in the, the system and uh, the capitalist system that we're navigating. And so they're not going to share everything with us. And everybody don't love you. And everyone doesn't. And I don't love everybody. Yeah, yeah. But truth has gradations. I love that concept. Well, when we think about the truth, Sheree, like beside your own home or or the church, as I sense is, is probably another place where you find comfort. What's the place that you feel safest to be yourself? Boy, it's probably it's probably in one of several homes. That's the safest place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't feel unsafe in Boise. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't feel and, and if you want to talk about a sense of place. Um, I don't feel unsafe in most cities. It's It was a really unique experience to travel internationally. You know, I mean, people think they send us, you know, we're, we're doing our corporate thing and we go over there and we don't know that. I can remember I was in, I think I was in Great Britain and we were staying in a hotel. And every day when I came out, this one guy was always going, you know, and so I finally asked my, my girlfriend I'm driving with, I'm, I'm traveling with white girl. And I said, gosh, he's sure friendly. I guess he must think I'm pretty nice lady. He goes, she said, no, he thinks you're a working girl because I was a black woman in that hotel. So I was just I was going, yeah. Huh. She goes, no, honey, he thinks you're a professional. <laughs> I mean, so that's some of those things you, you, you know that there's nuance depending on where you are, who you are. So while to be trustworthy, you gotta be smart. Yeah. You're, you're, you've gotta be smart, no matter where we are, home or abroad, we need to, to be thoughtful and not just run out, get crazy telling everything you know. And for them and us, we have to know that every person's not the same. Every boss isn't the same. Every leader isn't the same. They have their own special set of values and preoccupations and prejudices. And I don't mean prejudices by race only, but things that they want to get accomplished. There are some people that my mother used to say can be as good as gold, but they're just going to have to die out before they change the way they look at the world. Mm. They're, just not, they're not going to change. They're not going to change. No, that's true, right? And find find a space where you do have an impact. Uh, and, and true, I, I sense that you, there are many places that you have an impact, uh, and that you show up authentically most times. Like you are one of the most consistent people, like with that passion, purpose, right? Mm -hmm. um, that you show up. With. Um, but I wonder, like, is there something about yourself that you refuse to hide? That I refuse to hide? Yeah. Or that I do hide? Let's be both. I, I refuse to hide that, like that you show, and you kind of talked about earlier where you. Well, I mean, the the one thing that I had trouble with was seventy. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> that was the worst because you know women are judged so harshly when yeah. they get to be of a certain age. And I went, oh my god, I think that was that was the hardest thing. And then early on, it was how young I was because mm. I was doing things early, early when I was young. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty transparent. Yeah. Um, my sisters always say I need to be still and listen, but you know, I'm pretty transparent because you sure can't hurt me with something that I already tell you. Yeah. And I don't mean that I have to give you my cold dark surgery. And I'm and people always say, Oh no, no, no. And I go, Rem Webb is my third husband, bless his heart. And he's a happy man. Do you know what I mean? It's some of those things that are even, well, how could you do this and this and this and be married? When I was getting ready to run for office, everybody goes, well, what are you going to do about that? Tell them, the truth. The truth. You know, I, I'm not ashamed of it. Yeah. So um, transparency is a big deal. I, I I guess I can't think of an area that I was. Most, I remember one of the things that I was careful about. I was I served on the board for Planned Parenthood for a long time. I was president of that board. And I know it was a really polarizing thing in our community. And I thought the best thing to do right off the top is say I served not only on the board, but as president of Planned Parenthood. Yeah. And um we have all kinds of wonderful things that we do, some that you may like, some that you may not, but I found value in serving in that capacity. Yeah. You want to talk about it? Let's talk. If you don't, that's fine too. No, 
I think that's such important, like controlling your own narrative. And that shows up yes. when you're doing an, a job. I'm interview. writing that down. That was good. Control your own narr narrative. Thank you. But I think what you were just pointing to shows up even in job interviews. Like well, some of the, the best job interviews that I had was I knew the, the holes they were going to try to poke in my resume. And so I brought those up early on and addressed it um, and knew and pointed the thread to like, here's how I'm going to actually overcome that and be able to do this job. So you control your own narrative and don't. Absolutely. Like absolutely. Yeah. And, and one little uh, glitch in a, in, a, in a job description that you don't feel that. I mean, people always want to. This is what I don't have. This is what I bring to the party, folks. This is what I bring. Yeah. And I bring it fully and I bring it 100 percent instead of, you know, focusing on what's the deficit focus on the positive yeah yeah well focusing on the positive i'm curious like what was it that led you to uh decide not to run for office again 10 years <laughs> is that 10 10 10 and 10 telling you 10 yeah. years have mercy yeah have mercy yeah truly it, it had been long enough and, and i and i and i really do believe that that body needs to be vibrant and um really focusing on what's happening. And I, uh, yeah, I needed to focus on something else for a while. I loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it, but it was time. I don't think you stay on in perpetuity. I don't think that's correct because our communities change, our state changes, our laws change. You need to be up to speed. Yeah. Well, and for someone such as yourself that is constantly busy, like right, whether it's with your, your business, whether it's with giving yourself to the church or to somebody who finds you on the internet and says the <laughs> daughter is coming here and where did where does she go get her hair done? Yeah, how exactly. You, how do you find balance? Um, no, I, I just don't use that word very often. I mean, I, I used to use it all the time, but I realize I'm about the worst person to try to tell somebody about balance. I'm not really good at it. But I got to tell you, I get invigorated. I get joy from being busy. And when I get tired, I tune out. I go to bed early. I read books and I don't mess around for a few weeks. I'll just change my calendar or, or try to limit it. I think the balance has to be is my spirit, yeah. mind, body, and spirit. That's the big thing. And I do believe that there have been times in my life, women, listen, that I have not taken care of my physical body. I had sepsis last year. And they say, well, four or organs are, are impacted and so on. So and I go, uh-huh, but nothing hurts. So can I go home now? I mean, it was really crazy. It was, I mean, I'm really an intelligent person, but I was acting like a complete fool. And I kept saying, well, why can't I, why can't I? Well, well, you need to go sit your behind down and you need to stay home and you need to recuperate. So I'm not good at that, but I'm getting better at it because I'm old, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, but balance is, is not the word, not the thing that I strive for, but it's important. I, I see the relevance of it even more and more so that I can do justice to the things that are important to me. Right. Right. And, and I like you pointing in that direction because it's really more about centering yourself and you do like mind, body, soul is how you center yourself. And in light of that, um, sometimes we don't prioritize prioritize our wellness um, as black women, I think in particular, like, what is that? Like, it feels like, like we actually encourage ourselves through overcoming Right, that that kind oh. of that trauma, the trauma that we're experiencing, the resiliency. There's a sense of pride in that. What is that? Because it's I don't know. I don't know if that's the one thing we thought we had some some control over. You mm -hmm. know, because we really didn't have control over our bodies per se. Yeah. We didn't have control on what went into our bodies. We didn't have control about rest and all those kinds of things. So I don't know if it's just that we've got to prove that we are, you know, uh, the triple threat or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and I hope we'll do better and better. And I think of things like. I mean, you know, with my very round face and my very ample behind, I think about things like, um, oh, what do we get so much? Diabetes and all that kind of stuff. People just talk about their sugar and their sugar. And I thought, oh, that'll never happen to me. It could. Yeah. Yeah. And now I have to take care. Yeah. I waited a little while, but I need to take care now. We do. And we have to hold each other accountable. I think yeah. that like similar lived experiences around prioritizing others' health and not our own. Yes. And we as Black women need to make sure that we um, are holding each other accountable to take care of yeah. ourselves. Um, she, what, one last thing. I'm curious because you, your, your Rolodex is vast. And so I'm curious um, if you were to have a dinner party uh, oh. and you would invite four guests. Um, it could oh. be living I couldn't do four. I could not do four. I couldn't do four. Okay. I, I, there's just, I mean, there could, I could walk out of my house right now and somebody could be walking down the street and I go, oh, I want you to come too. You know what I mean? Because I think the richness of what women bring when they are together, we can rule the world if we desire. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that we haven't taken to ruin the, 
to ruling the world. And I think that's because we're smart. Yeah. We can impact the world. We can do all kinds of things to the world. But, you know, men that are ruling the world are getting sick and dropping dead and doing crazy things and not making good decisions. We have dominion over many things. And I think we're smart to continue in that arena. I can't do four. Yeah, I just can't right. do it. I'm I know, sorry. I, mean, I would have to be a fly on the wall for that dinner party. Well, and last question is, um, we have so many um, amazing people who listen to the show, uh, men and women, black and white, um, yes. from, from, from all walks of life. Like, What's one bit of advice or insight you would share with them as they try to unlock the club on their journey? I think the, the most important thing is even when you're trembling, to know that you are powerful beyond belief, mm -hmm. to know you have power. You are powerful beyond belief. Take courage and represent. And I'm talking about representing yourself the way you want to be represented. Don't let anybody take that power away from you to be who you are, fully who you are, and uh, grateful for that empowerment that you have received. That is beautiful. I love the juxtaposition. Even when you're trembling, you can still be powerful. And I think so often it's we feel it has to be mutually exclusive. Yeah. And we said we see we see Sheree Buckner Webb show up so powerfully and we presume that she's got everything in order and there's no fear showing up for her, but there's so much more. And you're still able to show up powerfully. And it's right there. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are some of the things that you have going on? Any projects or where can our listeners find um, the amazing Sri Buckner Well, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to sound like I'm talking trash, but I'm doing a lot of fun stuff. I'm working with Catalyst. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of Catalyst. I'm doing a couple of sessions with them just in the next two weeks. And I have my own consulting firm. I'm working with a couple of people that are running for office to help support their, their endeavors. And um, got my grandbaby. And I just bought a rental that I'm going to be pulling down walls and doing stuff. I love that stuff. I love that. I still like to keep my nails, but I, I, <laughs> I really love that stuff. I don't know why. That's, so I think about that good. outhouse grandpa showed me. And, that know. is it. It's so planted in you. I think we need to reach out to HDTV or Magnolia, <laughs> to, uh, you know, Sheree Buckner web show. Because um, no. they'd say that's not practical. And I go, I know, I know. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Well, we will make sure that all of our guests um, know where to find you on social media uh, and on LinkedIn. We'll share that in our show notes today. But Cherie, again, uh, it is always a pleasure to be in your company, whether it's just running into you um, somewhere in downtown Boise or to, to be in conversation or to get the encouraging texts that you send. Um, and I call I, you out. I call you out, my sister, Angela. I, I lift you up and I just uh, praise the work that you're doing and the impact you're having in our communities. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm again, just trying to follow in your footsteps and sure. just do a little bit of what you, you can doing. go better and go further. I'm a, that's what I'm looking for. We'll, we'll do it together. Well, this has been uh, another episode of Unlocking the Club. Sheree, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, for those of you that are listening, thank you for, for listening in. I know you heard so much information and insight from Sheree today um, that you can take and incorporate into your journey as you try to unlock all of the things that are in store for you and your future. Thank you all again for listening in to Unlocking the Club. We look forward to seeing you next time on the show. In between, make sure you share Unlocking the Club with your friends and your family. Yes. We're literally trying to help everyone on their journey in some way, shape, or form. And so we thank you for listening and we hope that you share Unlocking the Club with your friends and family. Until next time, I'm your host, Angela Taylor. Be well. Thanks for listening to Unlocking the Club. If this conversation resonated with you, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or your favorite streaming platform so that you can experience every episode. And follow us on social media where you'll hear about future guests, access special features, and connect with this amazing community. Head on over there and let us know how you are unlocking the club. Until next time, peace.